so the, the material for the test goes uh, until the homework I uh, gave you the solution today. Okay, so so this new material is not included. But the, homework. the homework is yes. Okay, so let's uh, go to section 2.2 .2 now, which is integration of positive functions. And we, so we give ourselves uh, Our triplet uh, x uh, a mu. Okay, so some set x, some some uh, sigma algebra a, and some measure mu on x on a, and then we look at a function that goes from x into r. And in all of this section, and that's very important, we'll be thinking about a positive function. Okay, so. Uh, zero positive infinity, and actually both are included. And we're going to start with uh, simple functions. So if phi is simple, we, d we define its uh, Lebesgue integral as this, where our phi is a uh, linear combination Okay, so you have uh, a very simple rule for simple functions, and uh, that's how we get our Lebesgue integral with respect to the measure mu. Now, uh, there are, we need to be a little careful here because, as I mentioned, uh, some of the AIs may be zero. And as you know, mu of AI may be infinity. So we need to know what we do when we have when we have zero times positive infinity. Well, our rule in these uh, problems is going to be that this is zero. Okay? Because we may see if uh, if I have a i equal to zero and mu a i equal to infinity, then. I get zero times infinity, and that's usually uh, undefined. Okay, if you have two limits, one goes to zero, the other one goes to infinity. You don't say that your limit is zero. That's wrong. But in this case, for this particular arithmetic we are doing, that's what our convention is. And. Okay, so first property <coughs> so we need to define this. We say that F is equal to G 
almost everywhere if mu of f different from g is 0. Or in other words, if the set of x's such that f of x is different from g of x is a null set. Okay, this is what we mean by almost everywhere is that when they are not equal, the measure of a set where they are not equal is zero. Of course, all this is with respect to mu. They may be equal almost everywhere with respect to mu and not equal almost everywhere with respect to another measure. Okay, it's going to be dependent on what your measure is. And, and to be more precise, you could say here, mu almost everywhere, just to make sure uh, we are talking about mu. So if we have phi equal to a simple function, when is phi equal to 0 almost everywhere? of x is different from 0 because all, all these are positive terms I need to have ai1 ai x different from 0 for at least one i Because if they are all equal to 0, you get, uh, you get 0. You don't get something different from 0. Different from 0 here means strictly positive because these are positive terms. So the only way you can be different from 0 is if uh, you have at least one term strictly positive. So this means what? It means that ai is strictly positive and x belongs to ai. So uh, this tells me the following, that uh, phi is 0 almost everywhere if uh, so how do I want to write this? So if there are two cases, if either a i is zero or mu of a i is zero for all i in one n. Because if, if I have simultaneously AI strictly positive and mu AI strictly positive, my function is going to be strictly positive on AI, which is not a null set. So it's not zero almost zero. 
So it's the only way I can achieve that is that is uh, under this condition. Okay, so uh, an easy consequence of this is that if phi is simple and zero almost everywhere, then the integral of phi must be zero. And the proof is very easy. We just write that phi d mu is the sum a i mu of a i. And this product is always 0, because either this guy is 0 or this one is 0. So the whole thing is 0, and we're done. Mm -hmm. So this is 0 since phi is 0 almost zero. Okay, uh, usual properties of the integral. Assume that C and phi are simple. Then uh, C phi d mu is C phi d mu. Uh, we need at this point we need C to be positive or zero since we are talking only about uh, positive functions. The integral of C plus phi is the sum of C plus phi. And uh, if phi is less than c, then phi d mu is less than c d mu. And finally, we define mu of E as being the integral of 1 E phi d mu, then mu is a measure. New, new, it's different from mu at least. So you create a new measure, 
which is going to depend on phi by doing this. So in order to prove that, I is just a, a, you just play with your C inside, outside the sum. Uh, you just use distributivity, that's all. So I'm going to omit that. For 2i, we we'll, we need the actual expression of this thing. So phi is going to be the sum from a i 1 a i from 1 to n <laughs> and c is going to be j from 1 to k of b j 1 b j okay I have my two simple functions and then uh, so right so then I can think of phi plus c as being a double sum over i and j of a i plus b j and the indicator would be a i b j. So what we're doing here is saying that if my x belongs to ai and bj, the value for phi is ai, the value for c is bj, and therefore the value of the sum is ai plus, plus bj. Uh, all these sets are disjoint because we started with a's and b's disjoint. So that, that works fine. I mean, you have only one term which is non-zero, possibly, which is this one. So once you have this representation, then you can write your integral of phi plus psi as being the sum So we have this, and now we, we split the sum uh, in two. So we have sum of i over i and j of a i mu of a i b j plus sum over i and j of b j mu of a i b j. And the, the remark here is that if you do the sum of all j's of mu a i b j, what do you get? What's the sum of all j of mu a i b j? You are taking the intersection of AI with all possible Bs. But the Bs cover the whole subset, the whole set. So you are going to get, you see, the union of all AI, BJ, is exactly AI when you, when you do the union of all Js. Because the union of the BJs is all of the space. Remember that's our convention for simple function, that when you write your indicators, like here, you have that the union is all of x. The union is all of x. So that's why you get this guy here. This union is disjoint, so you end up with mu of a i. So one of the, the sum in j gives you mu of a i, and you are left with 
the sum in I, AI mu of A, AI. And on this side, you do a symmetric thing, and you're left with a sum in J of BJ mu of BJ. And now you are done, because this is your integral uh, phi, and this is your integral psi. And you do a similar thing for the inequality. As you, you say that uh, AI must be less than BJ if AI BJ is not empty. This is because you are assuming that you're uh, is it phi is less than C. Okay, so this is the value. Uh, AI is the value on AI, and uh, BJ is the value on BJ. So at the intersection, you need to have this. So when you write your uh, when you write your integral, which is this thing, so same remark as before, I can write mu of AI as being the sum of uh, these mu's. quick here, maybe I should write things. Yeah, I need to I, I need to do it before taking the integral, sorry. So what I'm doing here is saying that phi is the sum of AI one AI and this is the sum over all J's of one AI BJ. And then you get what? You get uh, sum over all J's. You can invert your, your two finite sums, so that's not a problem. AI1, AI, BJ. And what we just wrote here translates into saying that AI this is less than BJ this. So this is less than Okay, because if your x is in here, then this guy must be less than this one. And if this is empty, then this is zero anyway, so it's a true inequality in, in, in all cases. Hmm. 
Okay. <coughs> so, uh, by taking the integrals now, we end up with uh, this sum Yeah, actually, this is not working. Um, I'm using what I need. Okay, it, it's uh, it's the same idea, but I if I do it this way, then I need now the property I'm trying to prove because I have two functions and I want to take the integral, so that's not recommended. So, uh, what wh what I start writing actually worked. Uh, so let's. Uh, so this is my third and last attempt. Let's rewrite this. What I wrote is correct. The problem is that it doesn't help me. So, that's the fundamental idea here. And then what we should write is that AI mu of AI BJ is therefore less than BJ mu of AI BJ. Why? Well, Two possibilities. If this guy is zero, if mu of a i b j is zero, this is true. And I don't have any problem. This is a true inequality. Zero is less than zero. If this is not zero, then it means that a i b j cannot possibly be empty. And therefore, a i must be less than b j. OK? Now I do my double sums. And I use exactly what's there, you see. It's exactly these sums here that give me the two integrals. So I just need to redo what's there, and I end up with phi d mu less than c d mu. And we have inequality. Now, there is the, the fourth property, which is about uh, defining a new measure. No, but I can't do that at this point, can I? Hmm, apparently I can. Okay, so uh, we are trying to construct a,
we are trying to construct a new measure and by doing the following. So phi is a simple function. OK, as always, and that's a fixed function. Then we define nu based on phi by saying nu of e is this interval. So you, you multiply your phi by the indicator 1e. You still get a simple function. And maybe these are things that I should have mentioned before. You still get a simple function for the following reason. Uh, when you get so your phi is uh, the sum ai one ai, and when you multiply by one e, what what happens in your opinion when you multiply two indicators? What do you get? Yeah, you get an indicator of intersection. OK, this guy is just 1 A I E. Because it's 1 if and only if both are 1, which means that you are in the intersection. So this is a simple function. We know what the integral of a simple function is. We are fine. Um, Okay, uh, we also know that new phi of e is positive because it's the integral of a simple function, and the way we define the integral is just a sum of positive terms. So that's not an issue. Now we take en to be disjoint, measurable sets, and we need to compute new phi of the union of en. And that's the integral of the indicator of the union times phi. Now, can I write the indicator of the union of this joint set as uh, something else. <coughs> Boys, let's start with a finite unit. Is there a simple relation between indicator of A union B with indicator of A indicator of B? knowing that A and B are disjoint. It's a sum. Because if I belong to the union, I belong to exactly one of them because they are disjoint. So that's why it works. Of course, if they are not disjoint, this is not true anymore. OK. so. At this late hour, we are not afraid to take some leaps. And we generalize this thing by saying, well, this must be true as well. And it's actually exactly the same argument. But now you have an infinite series of indicators. And so when I multiply by phi. <coughs> Excuse me. I get this. OK. 
Okay. Um, and then I, I want to take the integral of this thing. And I take the integral on both sides. Now I need to decompose my phi again. It's amazing. It's one line in the book. I, I'm so slow. OK. OK, so um, because what I want to do It's really what I want to do here. No, probably, OK. Hmm. Yeah, this is, again, not very helpful. Um, OK. What, so what I need to do, really, is this thing here. Rewrite this as being this so this is a fine sum. And uh, we are multiplying, so we can just put intersection here of this union of E n d mu. Okay, so now I have a simple function again. And this is this is a set E, uh, same remark as uh, I had there, and this becomes the sum a i mu of a i union of e n. But so let's look at uh, an individual i. And uh, so what I'm saying here is that AI intersect with the union of the EN is really the union of AI intersect EN. And these guys are disjoint because the AIs are disjoint and the EN are also assumed to be disjoint. So mu of this thing is equal to the sum over n of mu of a i e n. And going back to my integral, so going back to this integral, I shouldn't use the same n. That was a little unfortunate. Okay, so let's let's call it j from 1, uh, i from 1 to k. So that's my sum here, a i. And then this guy I just computed is the sum over all n of mu of a i e n. Okay. 
So now uh, another we we need to say that this is the sum over n of the sum over i of mu of a i e n, which is which is okay which is okay because I have a finite sum that I'm interchanging with an infinite sum. But the, this, this infinite sum is well defined. So you know, to write it formally, what you do, what you do is, well, uh, well in any case, what, what makes this work is that we are dealing with positive numbers only. And therefore, I can interchange my sums. But that we'll have to come back to. AI, this one? This one? Oh, I need it. Yes, yes, thank you. So, assuming we can. It is, yeah, it needs to be on the inside, thank you. Yeah. It, it needs to be in here. Okay, so assuming I can do that, then we have to come back to this, because that's an important question. So I just, I interchange my sum on n and my sum on i. Well, in that, if we can do that, then it's a sum. This guy here, is exactly the definition of uh, one a i phi, uh, no, one e n phi d. That's exactly what we get when we compute this guy. Because we multiply by e n across, we get this, and then we have the a i as a voice which turns, to, turns out to be the sum nu of en, because that's the definition of nu, it's taking this interval. And so this proves that we do have a measure by doing that. Uh, but again, we'll come back to this uh, uh, interchange of uh, two sums in, in uh, well, when you have positive numbers, you can do it, um, and you get it. you may get infinity on both sides, and it's still true. Um, but we'll justify why. Actually, it has to do with the fact that you can interchange two supremum. That's that's all we are doing. Okay, it's it's always possible if you have two indices to say that the supremum of a supremum is you know depend, you you can interchange your two variables. So, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll come back to this with uh, more time. Okay, so this gives us all the, uh, I mean, many properties for simple functions. We haven't talked already uh, yet about uh, other functions, measurable functions. But you'll see that with these properties and with the fact that simple functions converge that uh, any measurable function is a limit of simple functions. Uh, all the hard work has been done on simple functions, which is a lot nicer than doing it in general. Okay, so that's the strategy, is prove things for simple functions, use the limit theorem to prove it for uh, positive functions. And then from there, go to general functions. Okay, so for next week, uh, no homework, just have, have a look at the review and we'll go over the review and I'll go on with this.